History is littered with choices, dichotomies, and antagonisms. Nomads and settlers, Romans versus Carthage, capitalism versus communism, cat people or dog people. When it comes to personal hygiene, the big debate is shower or bath. We here at Today I Found Out don't judge. It is completely up to you whether you like to cleanse your skin and massage your muscles with a powerful, reinvigorating jet of life-giving water, or if you prefer to stew for hours in a broth of dead skin cells, environmental filth, and rectal leakage. You do you. And according to a poll we ran a bit ago on if time and convenience weren't a factor, would you prefer a bath or a shower to get clean? 81% of 51,000 of you doing you means getting naked and standing up while Earth's urine runs all over you, instead of laying around encased in warm fluids in reminiscence of your time in your mother's womb. On that note, the act of bathing at its core does not require particularly complex technology. You only need a sufficiently large and contained container of water with which to immerse yourself in. The shower, however, is a far more complex, refined, and fascinating artifact. So just who invented the shower, and how did the shower Hour as we know it today come to be. Before we dive into that and the rather kinky uses, psychiatrists used to use the torture device that was the early modern shower in order to supposedly improve people's health, because sure, why not? How about something that is actually good for you? Today's sponsor, AG1. If you, like me, maybe don't always eat the most well-rounded diet, Fear not, my friends, because AG1 has all our backs on this one, as well as a one-year supply of immune-supporting AG vitamin D3 plus K2 and five AG1 travel packs for free with your first purchase of AG1 using the link below. For those not familiar, AG1 is an all-in-one health drink that includes 75 whole food sourced ingredients, including various vitamins, minerals, and probiotics. It's also NSF certified, so you know what's written on the label is actually what's in the product. And let me tell you, as someone who has been a bit of a fitness nut for many years and is super into research, obviously, let's just say while it shouldn't be such a distinction, the reality is a health supplement company, even a lot of major brands that actually puts what they say is in their product in their product is shockingly rare. But again, AG1 is third party tested by the NSF and has received their certification, which to quote the NSF means this certifies the supplement contains the ingredients listed on the label and nothing else. And as for AG1, while it's certainly possible to get a super healthy balance of everything you need direct from your foods, let's just say for me, I absolutely eat very healthy in some ways in terms of getting a healthy balance of fats, carbs, and proteins. But in other ways, again, my food variety and particularly fruits and vegetables vegetable servings. I mean, I try, but to say I don't get enough of these is an understatement to the level of saying something like, Simon has posted a few videos on YouTube over the years. So just nice to know with AG1 I'm getting the full spectrum of vitamins and minerals that I might otherwise be missing in my diet and without any real complication. Just scoop, shake or blend, and drink. Easy peasy lemon squeezy. This is all particularly nice in the morning to start the day off with some good nutrients and getting hydrated at the same time, which, all combined, helps with alertness without the need for caffeine. And given I also work out a lot too, it's extra helpful there to make sure I'm getting all my micronutrients to support my efforts on that front, all in a nice comprehensive nutrition supplement good for the body, brain, and gut health. So if AG1 sounds interesting to you, once again, head over to drinkag1.com forward slash brain food or click our link in the description to get a one year supply of immune supporting AG vitamin D3 plus K2 and five AG1 travel packs for free with your first purchase of AG1. Now let's get back into how the shower went from the thing for cleaning to a medical BDSM health device and back again in very recent times to be for cleaning meaning mostly. To begin with, it's unclear how and when humans first managed their personal hygiene in prehistoric times. According to J.H. Musgrave, writing for Nature in 1971, even the Neanderthals got in on the action, using seashell tweezers to pluck hairs from their beards. When the Homo sapiens took the lead, it is possible to speculate that they used waterfalls as natural showers, but the first documented use of man-made showering took place amongst ancient Egyptians. In particular, the wealthy among them, who enjoyed having one or more servants pour jugs of water over their heads. 
The ancient Greeks improved on the concept. In their version of the shower, servants or slaves poured water into a hole which fed into a designated room where the person showering would be doused. Water had to be cold, as the Greeks, and Spartans in particular, believed that hot water was for sissies. If you had to mow down Persians at the hot gates, you had to take a cold shower first, apparently. Of course, in more recent times, people who wish to suck the tiny remaining sliver of joy from life have also recently begun pushing the same thing cold showers, not mowing down Persians. Although, we're pretty sure someone on the interwebs will probably suggest that at some point as the key to mental health and motivation. In fact, come to think of it, that was, in an abstract way, kind of the plot of Fight Club. In any event, this still primitive shower system later evolved as most Greek city-states developed their aqueducts and plumbing systems, replacing servants with piping systems. Around the 4th century BC, bathhouses, some equipped with showers, became widespread and were associated with physical and mental health. A prominent example of this practice is the Asclepion at Pergamum, a Hellenistic city in modern-day Turkey. The Asclepion could be described as a temple with adjacent spa and mental health center devoted to the cult of Asclepius, son of Apollo and god of healing. It was serviced by a spring of water, which may have had some therapeutic properties. It appears that these waters were slightly radioactive, but they were good enough to wash oneself in. In fact, archaeological excavations at the site found physical evidence of shower rooms as well as pottery depicting the act of showering. Fast forward to the 3rd century BC, the Romans showed up in Greece to perform their favorite party trick, deploying across three lines of infantry, skewering people, and kindly borrowing their best practices and achievements. Among the many advancements adopted from the Greek civilization, Rome imported the practice of building aqueducts and public baths. The Romans, however, had a preference for large basins and pools to plunge into rather than pipes to stand under. Beyond these much-talked-about groups in the Egyptians, Romans, and Greeks, others also had mastered the art of taming water to avoid stinking like rotting cabbage stew. For example, as early as 2500 BC, the settlement in Mohenjo-Daro in modern-day Pakistan was equipped with incredibly sophisticated piping and drainage systems. Almost every house boasted a private bathing area with drains to remove dirty water out into a sewage system. The walls of these areas were even sealed to prevent damage from moisture. Yes, it turns out humans pretty much everywhere didn't like to smell bad, and they were pretty good at finding ways to resolve the issue. But again, for most of history, and for most people, it seems like the prevalent fashion around the world was to bathe rather than to shower. The habit of showering, or at least showering by means of man-made artifact, fell out of favor throughout the Middle Ages, the Renaissance, and most of the modern era. Now that said, contrary to popular belief, bathing in general did not. In fact, bathhouses were all the rage as just a fun night out. As noted in the book Clean, History of Personal Hygiene and Purity by Virginia Smith, by the 15th century, bath feasting in many town bathhouses seems to have been as common as going out to a restaurant was to become four centuries later. German bath etchings from the 15th century often feature the town bathhouse with a long row of bathing couples eating a meal naked in bathtubs, often several to a tub, with other couples seen smiling in beds in the mid-distance. While this might seem a little odd at first glance through a modern lens, consider that many people today enjoy soaking in a hot tub or pool with their friends while drinking alcoholic beverages, which is not too dissimilar from these former bathhouse practices, except now usually featuring skimpy bathing suits instead of nude and naked. Going back to bathhouses, given that many were connected to bakeries in order to use heat from their ovens to warm the water, let's face it, there is no way one could sit there in water smelling freshly baked bread and not develop a voracious appetite. Between the nakedness and tasty bread, why are we now focusing our mental efforts on ice-cold showers and not bringing this whole thing back? And speaking of voracious appetites, given that many bathhouses were not gender divided and featured naked, now clean people having a good time together, it should also come as no surprise that bathhouses were known to be places to have a really good time. For those without a non-paid partner, these establishments were also frequently places to find or engage the services of exceptionally good-smelling prostitutes. So bathhouses were all the rage, what about showers at this time? These popularly began to resurface in the early 18th century, not as a personal hygiene habit, but as a treatment for psychiatric patients, or as they liked to call them back then, lunatics. Medical science in the early 1700s Europe was haphazard at best, and the same can be said for those treatments of patients affected by mania. According to a paper by Stephanie Cox from the Department of Occupational Science and Therapy, Auckland University of Technology, a quality that defined mania in the 1700s was a violent heat that boiled the blood and dried out the brain. 
Doctors back then felt that manic patients displayed signs of inflamed, distended blood vessels, all surely a consequence of said violent heat. Their natural conclusion was the same as many on the internet today when looking at mental health. That individual needs ice-cold water. This was thought to combat this inflammation and thus cure not only lunatics, but also patients affected by inflammation of the joints, ears, eyes, mouth, skin, and digestive organs, or even relieve fevers, headaches, and toothaches. One of the early proponents of the use of cold showers in psychiatry was Dr. Patrick Blair, who, in 1725, wrote about his experiences with one of his patients, a married woman who became mad, neglected everything, would not own her husband nor any of the family. Dr. Blair had the patient blindfolded, strapped to a chair, and then placed in a bathtub underneath a 35-foot high water tower. A jet of cold water was then poured upon her head from the top of the tower. I kept her under the fall 30 minutes, stopping the pipe now and then, and inquiring whether she would take to her husband, but she still obstinately denied till at last being much fatigued with the pressure of the water, she promised she would do what I desired, on which I desisted, let her go to bed. Blair resumed the treatment one week later, this time adding a second jet of water pointing directly at the patient's face, or to quote him, any other part of her head, neck, or breast I thought proper. As the woman at this point refused to promise she would love her husband and let him have his way with her, Blair subjected that naughty girl to a third session, 90 minutes long, showering her with 15 tons of freezing water from a water tower. When Blair threatened to subject her to a fourth session, she kneeled submissively that I would spare her and she would become a loving, obedient, and dutiful wife forever thereafter. I granted her request, providing she would go to bed that night with her husband, which she did with great cheerfulness. The practices enacted by Dr. Blair and his imitators wasn't exactly original, BDSM being a thing as long as humans have been humaning. While not technically original, this may have inspired the invention of the first patented mechanical shower for hygienic purposes. This patent was filed in 1767, ironically during the Kingdom of George III of Great Britain and Ireland, popularly known as the Mad King. The monarch experienced prolonged manic episodes and underwent several types of rather brutal treatments to try to cure it. But if you're wondering, one of them was not ice-cold showers, but rather ice-cold baths, because again, people have been pushing this icy water thing for mental health forever, and this madness needs to stop. But back to the first shower patent. It was filed by one William Feetham, a stove maker by trade from Ludgate Hill in London. His design consisted of a small tank or basin containing preheated water. The showeree would stand inside the basin and use a hand pump to lift water through some metal pipes, fancily painted to look like bamboo sticks. The water would then rain down from above and fall back into the basin. Feetham's invention was rather economical as it allowed the use of much less water than a normal bath. The problem was that it recycled the same water over and over again, meaning that it became filthier and filthier with each successive pump action and use. Now, one may argue that having dirty water pouring over your head or sloshing between your butt cheeks in a common tin bath did not make much of a difference, but the reception bestowed on Feetham's contraption was lukewarm, much like the water at the end of each shower. The ball was again in the court of psychiatric doctors for them to improve on this design for their kinky ice shower fetish as a part of their broader doctor-patient roleplay. In 1826, Belgian doctor Joseph Gooselang created a more sophisticated shower room for use in hospital wards, allegedly. In this one, water was collected atop the roof of the room in which patients sat bound to a chair. The hospital attendants, out of sight from the patient, would then open the pipes, surprising them with an indoor outpouring of raining cold water. Two years later, Dr. Alexander Morrison upped the ante of the showering arms race with a new design. Once again, his patients had to be strapped and bound, because of course they did, before being subjected to sudden streams of freezing water. The innovation was that the direction, size, and intensity of the stream could be regulated via a system of ropes and pulleys so that it could be, to quote, directed upon the head to diminish vascular activation in the brain as to repress violence, to overcome obstinacy, and to rouse the patient when indolence or stupor prevails. Morrison seemingly named the invention after himself, the douche. But actually, it just means shower in French. In 1835, American doctor Benjamin Rush outdouched Morrison, advising to apply freezing showers for 15 to 20 minutes before threatening the patient with death. Quoting again from Stephanie Cox's paper, these were considered effective strategies for resistant cases. Dr. Rush's shower was somehow less sophisticated than Morrison's invention. It consisted of a simple room, about three square feet in surface, topped by a wooden grating. Hospital attendants would pour water from above the grating from a height of one, two, or three stories. 
Fear, cold, shock were all considered to have beneficial effects on the brains of lunatics. Particularly, they appeared effective in breaking the will of the most obstinate of patients, thus making them docile in the hands of their dom, I mean doctor. The same techniques were borrowed by prison administrators in the first half of the 19th century as a way to inflict punishment without leaving the unpleasant mark of the whip or the truncheon. All was fine and dandy in European prisons until some pesky convicts had the cheek of dying as a consequence of what was, in effect, torture by shower. In 1858, the Medical Act passed by the British Parliament enabled the General Medical Council to regulate the education of physicians, thus cracking down on the numerous quacks which plagued hospitals and mental institutions. This act, combined with newspaper accounts reporting on the ill treatment of convicts and mental asylum patients, spelled the end of shock hydrotherapy, at least outside of for fun. And not only in Europe, a report on the prisons and reformations of the United States and Canada, authored by Commissioners E.C. Wines and Theodore Dwight, described the showering treatment as worthy of the outrages of the Inquisition and the inhumanities of the slave pen. In the end, in 1872, at the International Penitentiary Congress, the use of cold shower treatments was officially forbidden. However, prison administrators realized the importance of regular washing to prevent outbreaks of diseases and foul body odor, as well as to preserve human dignity and exert positive influence on mental and moral well-being. In other words, prisons started adopting the practice of communal, warm showers for pure and simple hygienic purposes. This conceptual shift was facilitated by technological advances. In 1868, London painter Benjamin Wadi Mon patented the first gas-powered water heater. This invention consisted of a burner powered by hot gases, which heated cold water as it flowed through pipes. Finally, Victorian Britain could enjoy the glorious feeling of hot water blasting over one's skin. There was a snag, however. Mon's invention lacked a proper ventilation system, leading to overheating and high pressure, which resulted in exploding showers. Combine that with arsenic wallpapers in Victorian houses, you're going to have a bad time. Mon's defect would be fixed only in 1889, when Norwegian-American engineer Edwin Rudd improved the design of the water heater with a safety feature, commonly known as the vent. But back to prisons. Following the 1872 International Penitentiary Congress, the French government encouraged prison doctors to pitch ideas on how to improve the cleanliness of convicts. Dr. Mary Delabos, physician at the Rouen prison, picked up the gauntlet and proposed a communal shower with a cellular design. Basically, each prisoner would stand in his or her own cubicle, open on one side to allow for guards to keep watch on them. Each cubicle was serviced by one showerhead, pouring a maximum of 25 liters of warm water per prisoner. Crucially, as the amount of water per shower session was limited, there was no need to recycle the dirty water, which was allowed to flow down a drainage system. This design is now commonplace in most prisons, barracks, schools, or gyms, but back then it was truly revolutionary. It took another physician, however, one Dr. Lasser, to take the concept out of the prison and into the wider world. In 1882, he promoted the idea of the people's bath, or a public, economical shower block for the poorer classes. By the end of the century, showers had become common across public baths, barracks, factories, schools, and ships, and slowly from there worked their way into homes. But to sum up as to who invented the modern shower, as with basically every invention, it was a series of people leading up to some pivotal version. In this case, many give the credit to the pivotal version to the aforementioned William Feetham, the English stove maker, or Mary Delabos, the French physician. Feetham's version perhaps wins out as it sowed the first seed of a purposely designed contraption to be used in a private setting, and which did not need the presence of an attendant or servant to maintain a flow of water. Of course, Mon and Rudd's inventions allowed us to discover the pleasures of being cleaned without dying of hypothermia. And finally, Drs. Melibost and his cellular design showers, and Lasser, taking it out of prisons and introducing it into the world, contributed to popularizing the version of the shower we know and love today. But in the end, throughout the 20th century, the shower has steadily gained in popularity. A 2019 poll conducted by Victoria Plumbing found that 58% of adults prefer showering over taking a bath and, as noted, 81% of 51,000 of our viewers say the same. And who can blame them? This deceptively simple contraption has gained a place of honor in our daily routines thanks to its cost efficiency, sure, but also because it provides a safe cocoon from the outside world. A cocoon where we can be at our most vulnerable, singing at the top of our lungs, or treating our shampoo bottles to a rousing speech. 